Bluestein Blanchette Advertising Group. You probably didn't know anything about that. You're going to know a lot more in a few minutes. I'm Jay Fidel. This is Think Tech, and history is here to help. And our regular host, Carl Ackerman, is here with us with his special guest, Clark Hultquist. And Carl is going to introduce Clark. Uh, Carl, would you try to hold it down to two hours? Okay, I'll, 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 you know, I'll do an hour and a half only. So, you know, um, Professor Clark Hultquist went to um, Hultquist, went to the University of Cincinnati. He got his MA and his doctorate at um, Ohio State University. And uh, just as, as a side, Clark, one of my friends, the guy who wanted to hire me was for a long time the dean of the School of Letters and Science, a guy named Kermit Hall. I don't know if he was there when you were there, um, but uh, he, he, he gave me a great offer at the University of Tulsa. And I said, Hawaii? Tulsa? I don't think so, Hawaii. But anyway, um, his research um, is on French advertising. But if you read his wonderful um, dissertation, he begins um, talking about Fernand Burdell in the structures of everyday life. And, um, you know, he is a uh, social historian. And the way I know uh, Professor Hallquist is he is my boss um, every year at the AP reading. Um, and he fulfills that George Arioshi slogan, quiet and effective. And uh, Clark, for your interest, George Arioshi was one of our great governors in Hawaii. And he won with that slogan, quiet and effective, which tells you as much about Hawaii as anything else, I think. Um, but he yeah, is, when you say quiet and effective, Carl, it does sound like it does sound like George Ariyoshi, but actually, it doesn't sound like you at all. No, I, I, I'm describing <clears throat> my my colleague. You know, because nice job, Clark. Straight... You really created something. <laughs> okay, you're out of time, Carl. Let's go. Let's go to the substance of the show. Okay. So we're going to talk uh, about so French no more, advertising. With no more further ado, the wonderful Professor Clark Holtzbeck. Oh, well, thank, you, thank you, Carl. Thanks so much for having me. And and I, of course, I don't know if you just want me to start. Like no, 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 no. We, we, we have to stay within our guardrails. I am sorry. Um, it, it, it treated as a defense of a dissertation. Okay. Oh, okay. I, will. I, I enjoyed that very much. I think. <laughs> I think when you got through it, that's the important thing. So, uh, Clark, you know, what is the difference between French advertising and American advertising? I thought we had a, a lock on that corner of the world. Well, we did. I mean, French advertising, and again, when we're thinking about, let's say, 150-year period since the 1870s, that in some sense, American and French advertising were re relatively even. But in the 1890s, French advertising explodes uh, especially, we would call it fin de siècle, the end of the century, in terms of poster advertising, Toulouse, Lautrec, et cetera. But American advertising, and some people may not want me to say this, catches up that American advertising modernizes a lot faster than French advertising. And of course, what does modernization mean? But the American economy becomes the number one economy of the world in the 1900. We have the largest big businesses in the world. We have the largest media in the world. And France, because of the Great War, really starts to fall behind. France had actually uh, the largest movie industry in the world. They had the largest automobile production in the world in 1900. But the Second World War really sees them sort of fall behind. The United States takes off in the Roaring Twenties. Uh, American advertising pulls incredibly ahead in terms of its um, the print capabilities, the print quality, uh, eventually photography being brought into advertising, what we would eventually call market research, uh, the application of psychology into advertising in the 1920s. So French advertising on the surface was wonderful from the 1890s through the 1930s, but American advertising basically is better, though some people might critique me for saying that. No, we won't, not here. Excellent. But, you know, my, my view of it, and I don't know how you feel, Carl, my view of it is that French advertising, advertising the French culture and all that, is largely a question of advertising French products, a lot of which are devoted to women, and uh, the uh, haute couture, um, the perfume, um, and, you know, other elements of, um, of, of, of womanhood, uh, as, as celebrating the woman, which I think French culture does do that. It celebrates the women. So how much 
of French advertising goes to celebrating products that extol the French woman? I would say a lot, but it, of course, it also depends what time period we're discussing. In general, from an American perspective, what most French advertising we see is, as you correctly said, luxury goods, luxury products. The biggest uh, luxury firm in the world is Louis Vuitton, Moet Hennessy, uh, Bernard Arnault is the owner or CEO. It depends upon what time of the day that either he or Elon Musk is the wealthiest person in the world. He's worth about $160 billion. And so we will see in the United States a lot of advertisement, a lot of their products. But in France, obviously, they have to advertise a lot more than products, luxury goods. So they have a fully developed advertising system, you know, for automobiles, uh, for personal products, for food, uh, movies, radio, et cetera. So from our perspective, we don't really see it on a daily basis, the sort of average French advertisements that are aimed at everyone. We do see, Jay, and you're very correct, the sort of luxury goods that really celebrate women. Yeah. Well, I told you before the show began, I'm a, I'm a former uh, Francophile. I, I studied French uh, in every level of my education, uh, and not only the, the language, but the literature. What I did not study was the French history, and it was only later that I became, you know, more familiar with French history. And what I found, um, and a part of this is the American media and the French media, the films that have been made about what happened in World War II um, and around anti-Semitism. And, you know, if you study um, French advertising, you have to study Bluestein Blanchett um, and his uh, adventures. Um, but if you do that, then you have this kind of strange intersection between advertising and anti-Semitism. And I have trouble reconciling that. It does not make me more of a Francophile. It makes me less of a Francophile. Uh, what are your thoughts about that intersection? Oh, it, well, I'll give a brief summary of French anti-Semitism. The operative word is being brief. And so there's an incredible resurgence of it in the 1860s. And it always had been under sort of a low simmer. Napoleon in the 1790s actually gives probably the first time anywhere in Europe full civil rights to French Jewish citizens. But in the middle of the 19th century, as France begins to urbanize, quote unquote, modernize, industrialize, there becomes a horrible press, uh, a press system newspapers that, with the help of advertisers, begins to advertise basically anti-Semitism. Uh, part of this, and, and Blanchard's, Blustein Blanchard's, Blustein Blanchard's family, as part of this, in the 1860s, a lot of Eastern European Jews um, from Russia or the Pale of Settlement uh, in Eastern Europe would begin to emigrate to France. Uh, they're perceived by a number of French, especially middle class, as the other. They're not like us. They don't talk like us. They have a different religion. And so French anti-Semitism for the last 30 years of the 19th century increases. And of course, the Dreyfus case is the worst example of this. And I probably shouldn't give a lecture on the Dreyfus case right now. So yes, the, Jay, you are correct about this. Um, right before the Great War, French anti-Semitism actually was higher than German anti-Semitism. Uh, the German historian Richard Evans in his three volume work on the Third Reich says in 1910, and this is one of these counterfactuals, but if one had thought which country in Europe might be responsible uh, for a mass execution of thousands to millions of Jews, it might likely be France and not Germany. Oh, okay, Carl, time for you to react to all of that. Did you know that? And if you didn't, what effect did it have on you to find out today? Well, I, I didn't know the latter, but, you know, uh, I, I read um, uh, Professor Halkut's, uh dissertation with great great pleasure. And um, what I'm interested in, um, in finding out is, how did uh, Marcel Blustein, um, for, forgive my uh, pronunciation, how did he overcome the French um, disillusionment with advertising? Because as you mentioned, you know, they were really afraid of advertising because of the false claims of the pharmaceutical industry. And I, I hope that you will tell Jay and I the story of how he first got on the radio and used the Soviet Union to do so. That, those are two wonderful things. I'm going to be quiet because you're the expert here. Yeah, so uh, 
just like the United States in the same period of time in terms of the sort of birth of advertising, there's no advertising controls. You know, today we have the United States is called the AAA, the American Association of Advertising Agencies. They try to act as a self-policing group for sort of honesty and truth in advertising. I don't want, I won't comment on the effectiveness of it, but it's certainly better to have these sort of standards than none at all. Than none at all. So the United States, there is tremendous amount of snake oil sales. You look at old newspapers and magazines, various curatives and cure-alls and oils and pills. I'll, I'll spare you. You're all nodding. You know what I mean. And so for us, really wasn't any different than the United States in this that a lot of these products were incredibly cheap because they didn't cost anything to make. And the more that one advertised, the more potentially that people could buy that. So I don't know if that really answers your question or not, but French advertising explodes in the 1920s, just like ours does. They have their own version of the Roaring Twenties, uh, the newspapers and magazines, and there's really an economic recovery from the Great War. Uh, there's also a mass amount of uh, urbanization during the 1920s. France is in the process of not being a country of peasants. So in 1900 in the United States, half the American population was rural, half was urban. France doesn't hit that rate roughly until 1930. But the 1920s starts to see a lot more people living in the cities. Uh, they want to buy products that acculturate them to living in the city. Uh, I'll sort of spare you for potentially what that means. So I hope, is, is that good enough on this first part uh, of your question? Well, let me go, uh, let me go back to the original thought I had. And that is, um, how did um, um, Marcel um, Lustin Blanchet, Blanchette, whatever, uh, how did he cope with the anti-Semitism? He's building an empire um, around advertising and yet advertising always includes a certain amount of propaganda and propaganda always includes a certain amount of disinformation. Um, how did he cope with that? How did he build an empire uh, when what he was doing included uh, uh, anti-Semitic propaganda? I think, and again, I don't know if I have a perfect answer for this. Um, a lot of what we know about him is actually in his various memoirs uh, in the 1970s and 80s. He begins to publish sort of a three-volume sort of survey of his life. Uh, there's not too much really written about him from a scholarly perspective. Uh, another difficulty in terms of sources on him is that Publicis, their main office on the Champs-Élysées, burned to the ground in a fire, and so almost all the records are gone. So part of it is sort of piecing things together from what people wrote about him, uh, what trade journals wrote about him, what he wrote about himself. And certainly I think we can believe most of it, but he is an advertising man and he, he might want to sort of um, uh, oversell himself. Uh, I, I'll use a comparison in terms of what he was, was somewhat like, uh, a younger audience may not know this person, but Richard Branson. Uh, he was a pilot, he was an adventurer, he was a self-promoter, both of them basically were. So I, I don't know how much he really overcame anti-Semitism. The one thing I will mention, French anti-Semitism existed, but on the other hand, there was a lot of toleration for Jewish people during the 1920s, the 1930s, and the era in which he lived. And so certainly he, he faced difficulties, he faced struggles. Uh, he perhaps, in some sense, had a lot of help early on when he first starts his advertising agency. Uh, both his parents and his aunt and uncle owned furniture stores, and that certainly gave him his first sort of simple primitive accounts. I mean, perhaps 100 francs a week sort of rolled in. Um, I think it was sort of as energy. Uh, Carl knows something about his charisma, just like Richard Branson has a lot of charisma. He basically sold himself in the 1920s and the 1930s. You have to be able to sell yourself to be successful in advertising. My experience in meeting people who are involved, but but Carl, can you talk about his charisma? Not only charisma, but you know, I, you know, I want to go back to that question about how you know he was able to do things. And you know, from reading your dissertation, um, uh, Professor Hallquist, one of the things that really struck me was how he went to radio quickly. And, you know, like the, you know, the people with the internet who saw the internet and then made millions because they saw that, like Steve Case, uh, 
um, or Steve Jobs rather. Um, but um, I, I think that's very interesting. So I want you to talk about that. And the, the Soviet story about the radio really caught my attention. I, and can you tell um, our readers this? Because you know, Jay and I know about it, but our readers do not. And I think it's just hilarious. I, I will. So radio was in its infancy during the 1920s, very much its infancy. It's really not the, until the 1930s it begins to pick up. Partially, as I mentioned before, is the rise in consumer culture. So in 1924, there wasn't much of a radio industry because most people didn't have and couldn't afford radios. But with economies of scale, radios start to become, you know, I'll say less expensive, maybe three to four hundred dollars for a sort of, uh, you know, model you would put, you know, in your living room. Everyone would listen to it if they could. So perhaps 30 to 40 percent of French consumers or French families, I should say, might have had radios in the 1930s. Uh, Blustein Blanche was looking for other ways to advertise the radio at this point had not been deeply penetrated by, penetrated by advertisers or advertising agencies. So his idea was to buy a radio station um, with himself, with, with money from others and perhaps family members, change it into a modern radio station, whatever a modern means. So he had met David Sarnoff, who's sort of the father of NBC and RCA, uh, Blue Sun Blanche, two different times went to the United States in the 1930s. Uh, certainly from what I know, his English wasn't very good, so he likely had a translator with him. And he sort of learned at the knee of Sarnoff, who's perhaps 15 years older than Blue Sun Blanche, the importance of radio. So when he returned to Paris, he was able to get a little bit of money to buy a French radio station. He renamed it Radio Cité or, or City Radio or Radio of the City. But the problem was its transmitter, trans, the trans, transmitting number that it had, and I, I would assume it would be our version of AM, was very weak. It could only reach a couple of miles. And so this would not produce a very large audience for him. There was a radio station in the Soviet Union in Bessarabia that had a radio transmission number that he hoped that he could use, that he, he could buy basically from the Soviet Union. So he traveled to the Soviet Union, I want to say 1937 and 1938. He had an interview with someone, and of course they weren't really interested in selling uh, one of their sort of uh, ways to reach their own people. And so basically the Soviet Union said no. Uh, he returned to France. Uh, at this point, he was very well connected as he became wealthy. He became a French millionaire in the early 1930s. And so he had contacts within the French government. A French minister basically said, well, how did it go? In other words, how did, uh, getting the uh, radio transmission frequency. And he said it went great. And of course, the French government minister assumed that meant the deal went through. And so Blustein Blanche ended up just using semi-illegally that radio frequency for the next seven years or next four years to broadcast to the French people. And so you would say that that was an example of sort of entrepreneurial boldness to sort of get what he wanted. Indeed, indeed. So we've we've examined a little bit about uh, the, you know the fact that he was very outgoing, the fact that he was uh, comporting with um, French culture and uh, luxury items and and ladies' items and all that. Um, but um, I I have another thought I want to throw at you and see what you say. Um, you know I would imagine that French advertising was a celebration of the entire spectrum of French culture. In other words, the language, the music, the way of doing artful presentation. I mean, to the extent it was visual media. Um, in other words, perfect French and really appealing graphics had to be part of it because I, I think that's part of the French culture. And it emanated from the 19th century, from all those posters you were talking about. It carried forward. So we, we can't compromise on any of that. And this is what the French people were most affected by. Am I right? You are. Though mm -hmm. I will add a, a um, disclaimer about this, is that in the 1920s and 1930s, uh, reproductions of both magazines and newspapers were quite primitive. Mm 
And so in theory, a lot of the advertisements look very beautiful, but the practice is they didn't come out so well. So in other words, poster ads continue in the 1920s and 30s to be glorious. Reproductive techniques for posters were tremendous. Uh, you may recall that there's a great, great uh, poster, and I cannot remember the artist, and I should, but the 1930s. It's for the French cruise ship France or La France, and it's a great frontal view of this ship uh, sort of steaming into your line of sight. And so they're very good doing those types of advertisements in terms of the visual image, but mass reproduced advertisements, not quite so good. It's not until the 1950s that French reproductive techniques for magazines and newspapers basically catches up with the United States. And um, uh, Bluestein uh, Blanchet probably uh, attended to that by um, taking the most uh, current technology, whatever was available at the time, and as a good entrepreneur, he was right at the cutting edge using that sort of thing. And so uh, it goes to another question I want to ask you. And so today, um, this is really interesting. Today, we have a very highly developed Madison Avenue and so all across the country, advertising sector and industry. A lot of people make their, make their lives and get rich doing advertising, for sure, in an active economy. <clears throat> but what about in, in France? Um, is, is, are the French doing what he was doing? That is grabbing the latest technology. Um, are they using social media? Are they using, mm, I don't know, a cable TV and YouTube types of presentations? Are they with us, behind us, or ahead of us? Well, it depends. I would say they're with us and maybe even ahead of us, but it depends. And so, Advertising is a global business. Uh, it really becomes so in the 1960s. The largest ad agency in the world was an American firm, J. Walter Thompson. That in some sense, they conquered the globe with their advertisements in the 40s, 50s, and 60s. And I, I wrote about this, and it's also in my dissertation, but a separate article I'd written quite a few years ago. And so Publicity certainly mimics and models that. But this is not in my dissertation, so I'm, this is a secret from Carl that from the 60s to the present, Publicis grows even faster. So today they're the third largest advertising agency in the world. Um, they own advertising agencies in the United States. Oftentimes they will buy them and they don't change the, their name. So you may be familiar with the Chicago ad firms called Leo Burnett. They're the ones who created the Marlboro, Marlboro Mat in the 1950s. They still let Leo Burnett agency practice under their name. And so, Jay, when you asked, are they sort of with us, ahead of us, behind us, they are us, if this makes sense, that French advertising, I don't even know in some sense if it exists other than in France to French people, that their advertisements basically all over the world will certainly look a lot like our advertisements. Mm -hmm. You know, say all over the world, <clears throat> more and more it becomes clear there are French-speaking countries and areas that maybe used to be colonies, you know, who knows uh, what the evolution was for any one of them, but um, they're French speaking, they speak French. And um, you would expect that any advertising agency centered in France would be reaching out to all of those French speaking societies everywhere. Um, so the question is, um, do they? Um, do they reach French speaking countries uh, with their advertising? Um, do they reach other languages with their advertising? Oh, certainly they reach because they advertise in, in other languages. So they probably advertise in 140 languages with office all over the world. So they have offices in India. So they're going to advertise in Hindi. They have advertising agencies that they own in Japan. And I'll, I'll spare you that. And so, yeah, so uh, within Africa, there's some perhaps 60 million people who speak French, maybe even more. And so certainly they will advertise in French to them, plus their local languages. So yes, so, th so they're a global brand and they advertise in 150 languages because they want to reach as broad of an audience as they possibly can. Hmm. Selling anything, not just French products for women. Oh, eh? Certainly, because they're yeah. going to sell products. If they have an ad agency in Japan, they're going to be selling Japanese products. Uh, certainly multinational. Um, so um, I have one more question, Carl, but I want to give you the opportunity to, to um, express whatever is on your mind, whatever question is on your mind now. 
Well, you know, um, the really the beauty of this um, dissertation is that, you know, um, what will hack, what will happen to Bluestein is that he will get his, he will leave France two days before the um, invasion of Paris. And um, then he will, he will fight for, you know, uh, de Gaulle's uh, uh, France in exile and, and become a pilot. This guy is the perfect man for a movie. And uh, so I, I wanted to um, just ask Professor Hultquist uh, a sort of a double-edged question. One is, are you going to um, make this into a monograph? Or maybe you've done that already. And second of all, you know, would you be interested in someone from Hollywood picking this up? Because it has all the earmarks. And you can have a byline about Mad Men, which was such a popular show in, in the United States. So th those, that's my double-edged question for you. Today. Well, yes. Uh, so if you know anyone on Netflix and they need a historical advisor, I come cheap. So I, I'd be glad <laughs> to do that. And it is an amazing story uh, how he escapes through Spain, you know, sort of two steps ahead of the Nazis. Uh, in 1940 and, and makes his way to London of the Free French. And of course, what, why that is helpful, that it buys him credibility uh, at the end of the Second World War. And again, we're, we have a minute, so I, I won't say any more than that. But um, in terms of my own scholarly work, I don't know if I'm going to turn this into a monograph. I know, I hope next fall to go on sabbatical and work on this uh, uh, Vichy era advertising. So we'll see if I come first full circle there. Uh, I'll give Jay the last question with 50 some seconds left. Well, I, I'd like to, um, you know, second the motion that Carl made. Um, we don't know enough uh, about what happened in Europe. Um, outside of Germany, I mean, there's so many movies and documentaries about uh, the Germans and their war, um, but we don't know that much about Vichy. Uh, we don't know much about Spain. Just last night, I was watching a, a, a television program you know, there are fewer American television programs that are coming online right now because of the strike. I was watching a Spanish program called Jaguar, and it was a, a revelation to me about how um, Nazis, after the war, uh, came to Spain under the protection of uh, Franco and enjoyed a very nice quality of life in public, announcing their connection with the Nazi party. And I didn't know about this. And I was gratified to see that somebody was covering it. Um, and the same thing about Vichy and Vichy's relationship with, you know, that whole affair in Spain, Germany, we don't know enough about it. So from an historical point of view, especially on this show, history is here to help. Uh, we need to know more. So I, I second Carl's motion and your inclination. Okay, but my last question um, is this, Clark. Why this? Why this topic? Why did you write your dissertation about this and stay with it? You're still on it. You're still thinking about it. In retrospect, was it the right decision? Oh, totally the right decision. Uh, you know, briefly as an undergrad, I sort of uh, dabbled as a business major, uh, but also my father was involved. Uh, he was an advertising person, but he was, a, we'll call it a sales rep. Uh, you may have heard of the Kroger company, the largest grocer in the world. And he, he was interested in terms of promoting their products. So I, there, there's sort of a family interest. And so even before I started this dissertation, I was interested in sort of the advertising world and the creativity here. But then in graduate school, I was a French historian. I knew I was going to write something on France. And my advisor, who was very, very helpful in terms of picking a topic, he didn't steer me to this, but he steered me away from things like Napoleon, the Great War, things that were overdone so much. And very, very little had been done in consumer culture, at least when I started my work uh, in the late 80s and early 1990s. And so it, things have sort of came together. Uh, and again, it's a much longer story, but I hope that gives you a sort of an idea. I sort of stumbled into it, but I just love it. I love the intersection of modernization and Americanization, uh, consumer culture, everything sort of coming together. Because the 1920s and 1930s to so both France and the United States, it's somewhat like our world. I mean, I don't want to live there, but if you time transported me back there, I would, I would see a lot of things we're familiar with. And I think Carl was correct when he was talking about the media age, the 1920s, the 1930s, being somewhat similar to our information age in terms of the Internet. Mm, remind me of that movie with Woody Allen, Mid Midnight in Paris, I think it was, yeah. 
Uh, it'd be great to live there, but you know, just for a few days. Exactly right. <laughs> I want to come back? <laughs> so, Carl, uh, let's hear your uh, your your closing remarks on this. What have we learned? What has history learned here? And you you might also include how it was to work for Clark. You mentioned that, and what kind of a boss was he? You know, be candid, okay? <laughs> First of all, you know what a pleasure it is to hear from uh, Professor Clark Holtquist in terms of his work in um, social history, in terms of, of French advertising um, in the early parts of the 20th century, you know, ranging all the way to the post-war period. So, you know, that was, uh, you know, um, um, a particularly interesting and, you know, focusing on one particular ad man and what he was able to do in building a company was particularly interesting. And um, of course, as, as Jay focused on, you know, this is, just a prelude to the Holocaust, and so uh, Bluestein Blanchetta has to has to or Blanchet has to um, um, worry about all of this. But um, you know, I, I think it's 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 this sort of uh, social history um, uh, that uh, Fernand Brudel had talked about in the structures of everyday life, um, um, and social history just fills out the, so many gaps and things like this. Um, and to conclude with, um, you know. Um, I was uh, particularly happy, and I remember sending him a, a message by email um, when Clark Holquest became the chief reader, which is an enormous task with hundreds of different people, all of whom, I, you know, I think are splendid people. Um, um, but it's an enormous task, a great responsibility, because every European, every kid that takes um, European history is entrusted to Clark and his predecessors as chief readers uh, to do a good job. But he's a very mild guy, and I... I appreciate that. And, you know, Jay and I, you and I are not so mild, I think, uh, by, by temperament. But um, I, I do appreciate, although when I'm in my professional life, I tend to be very mild and the students, I tend to be very mild. But um, I, I think that it's really a pleasure to work with someone who embodies that word kind, which is um, something that's become increasingly important to me as this Ashkenazi ages. <laughs> Thank you, Carl. Thank you for putting us in touch with Clark. And Clark, I only have three words for you in closing. <laughs> one of them, of course, is au revoir. Uh, one of them is uh, à bientôt. And the third one is à tout à l'heure. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you, Jay, for this opportunity. Thank you, Carl, for the invitation. I very much enjoyed the conversation. Thank you. Merci. Merci beaucoup. <laughs> See you too. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please click the like and subscribe button on YouTube. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and LinkedIn. Check out our website, thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.